Hey everybody, Rose Matter here. Welcome to part 8 of my Higurashi When They Cry Let's Play. So in the last episode, things really picked up. Oishi-san told me about the history of Hinemizawa and the mysterious deaths and, uh, you know, dropped the bombshell that my friends might not be as innocent as I thought they were. They're not as far removed from all this stuff going on. And uh, they kind of proven right when, uh, you know, they tried to uh, hurt me with a goddamn sewing needle in my food, so now I'm scared to uh, interact with my friends, which is a very unnerving feeling, and it's giving these me these feelings of paranoia, which is what I assume the game wants. So we're going to continue on with this. We're going to see how Keiichi does, you know, having to deal with just acting. I'm like, everything's okay now, and how he's going to deal with his friends potentially turning on him. So let's get into this and see where the story takes us next. Tanto直入に自殺させる薬ってないんですか直接的にはない。遠回しですね。では間接的にはあるってことですか? <笑> 自殺したくなる精神状態を誘発することはできる。ちゅうことだ。難しい方になりましたね。何ですかその自殺したくなる精神状態ってのは。例えば、一般的な心理学研知から言えばじゃが、心理面が内向状態から外向状態に転じるとき
さらに打ちどころが悪くて脳に障害が起こり自虐行動に走ったうーんもうちょっと省略して言ってくれませんかね<笑>つまり乱闘中に豆腐の角に頭ぶつけてそれで異常が発生したと言っとるんだ<笑>じゃあ星には殺意はなかったってことですかねちょいと小銭を巻き上げようと思ったらたまたま殴りどころが悪かったと。The two plump men laughed hoarsely. I just want to get to the actual like, story part, it's like really picking up now. I know these are important to the story, but I'm just like. I need to know what's gonna happen when he gets to school. Like, what the hell is gonna happen? Alright, next up, the threat. Yeah. ケンギとシギのその先だ。面白いっすね。親戚同士でケンギとシギやってんすか。これがずるいんですよ。お互いの名前で事前運動バンバン。片方の選挙中にはもう片方が別に講演会を開いて、二十に選挙運動やってんです
Pushing him into the cab, I gave the driver the department chief's address. おいさん。はいはい。過去の事件は全部個別に終わってる。縦に並べるのはやめるんだよ。村の連中は半ば本気で祟りを信じてるんだから。私だって祟りなんか信じちゃいませんよ。おいさんは来年で退職じゃないです
but next time we'll use a more assured method. Like that. Something like sending a letter with a razor inside would have been a joke compared to this. Something about my mom's du uh, dubious gaze bothered me. She seemed more concerned about her son missing two days of school rather than him being sick. It was definitely mental fatigue. I wasn't really physically ill. I'd heard that line many times before. I was given an award in elementary school for having perfect attendance, but it wasn't like I was healthier than everyone. Yay, that's gonna be fun. Mom's tone meant I couldn't argue about it, so I had to give up on skipping a second day. <laughs> yeah, that's gonna be kind of hard to explain. It was an art project. My dad would understand. I didn't feel particularly guilty for doing it, so I didn't have much of a reaction. Also, Mom didn't question me any further about it. She headed back downstairs after she was certain I was getting up. What Mion said yes uh, as she left yesterday, I'd hate if you miss school tomorrow, came back and dwelled in the back of my head. What did she mean by that? I didn't even have time to really think about it. She was saying, don't be absent. Taking that a bit further, it was the same as her saying I should just go about living my life as if nothing happened. If I showed any signs of acting unusual, it would probably result in them making their move. If I acted differently, someone like Oishi-san, for example, might end up noticing that something is up. Meaning, if I didn't watch my mouth or did anything different from the norm. In effect, it would end up communicating something to those who were undesirable. And it seems, that was something the girls didn't intend to forgive. So, if I just went along as normal, no harm would come to me. Was that how it was going to be? All that misery I experienced up until yesterday would, almost creepily, just fade away. It was an enticing deal. Just by forgetting everything I'd seen or heard the last few days, I'd be able to keep living just like normal. I swallowed hard. I once again deliberated on the idea that I had just rejected. Mion was probably a good person who had her friends at heart. She was giving me, who had mistakenly broken some rule of theirs, a chance. Was what I did really something so unforgivable? But Mion had given me another chance. She was saying if I just forgot everything and kept living on like I had been, I'd be forgiven. It's like he's torn between wanting to get answers from Uishi about what's happening and also trying to appease his friends so nothing happens to him. Oh, but we know that Keiichi's not really the best at, you know, internalizing his feelings and like just trying to act like nothing's wrong. He's gonna let something slip. I crammed my textbook into my bag and hastily made my way downstairs. I picked up my somewhat bland breakfast. It seemed I didn't have much time. It was already past when I usually met up with Rena. Given yesterday's events, she'd probably be here in the next five minutes. I needed to be ready to head to school by then. I had to forget everything that had happened the past two days. Forget it all and return to my normal life. For this to be normal, I'll have to be where I normally meet up with Rena. Today of all days, the rice was dry and hard to get down. Ding dong. I jumped at the sound and dropped my chopsticks. That chime signaled that Rena had arrived. Mom hurried me along. My mother's merry smile and my gloomy face were polar opposites. Honestly, I was reluctant to see Rena, who was waiting there on the other side of the door. The Rena on the other side. Was it the Rena I knew? I couldn't keep her waiting. I needed to do things as usual. Whoa! Whoa! That was a... <laughs> I don't know if that was my game glitching or if that was supposed to happen. No jump scares game, come on! An invigorating greeting filtered in from across the doorway. Keiichi-kun, I was late, but how are you today? 
Rena. The manner in which Rena was concerned was, without a doubt, the Rena I knew. But that was probably only if I reciprocated. Forget everything from yesterday. Pretend as though nothing had happened. Forget about the gruesome dismemberment. Forget about the mysterious deaths that happened the following years. Forget about the people falling to their death, and the terminal illness and suicide, the fatal beatings, and the disappearances. Forget it. Forget all of it. Forget that Rena and Mion were scary. Of course, forget it all. Forget about all of it. Forget about the mochi, too. Forget, forget, forget. Rena once again asked to make sure. Yay, just who I want to see. Rena showed me her usual bright smile. I couldn't find any hint of deceit in her expression. My nervousness dissipated, giving way to relief. Oh. Oh, okay. The music stopped there. I was like, uh-oh. Oh. As we were walking, Rena talked about a lot of different stuff, more so than usual. Everything Rena talked about was just silly nonsense, so I just replied every so often and laughed from time to time. It was a rather laid-back conversation. We passed by one of our neighbors and they called out to us. Uh-oh, she's not going to be happy. We made her wait. After greeting our neighbor with a smile, Rena turned back to me and poked her tongue out. Not expecting that, I couldn't help but crack a smile. Rena stopped and stared at me. Uh-oh. With a grin, she gently poked my cheek. It was a bright, sincere smile. Hey, Kaichi Maibara. How can you still doubt Rena after she, uh, after she shows you a smile like that? Maybe I just had a high fever up till today, and I imagined everything that I thought happened because I was bedridden and delirious? I really hope that was the case. Oh, she's gonna flip right now and tell me that nope. That was not a dream. If God would grant me just one wish, there's only one thing that I'd wish for. I would want what happened in the past few days. More specifically, from the night of the Watanagashi up until last night. I wanted all of that to have never happened. I wonder how many times I wished for this these past few days. As long as Rena kept on smiling like this, I think it might just become reality. So I wanted Rena to keep on smiling. Keep on smiling. Oh, here we go. Here we go. It's about to get serious right now. Yep. Come on. Yep. Yep. No. <laughs> oh. Bum, bum, bum. That vain wish of mine was instantly shattered. My heart began palpitating. The relaxed morning mood suddenly became frigid. Rena's smile was the same smile as usual. Her eyes were gentle as usual. Those mochi yesterday, did you eat them all? Of course she wasn't asking the question at face value. In other words, Rena was asking, did you get the message? She was probably trying to convey that. But in an innocent way that anyone just hearing the conversation wouldn't uh, think anything uh, was happening. I was reluctant to give an answer. Rena stopped walking and stared deeply into my eyes. Uh. Don't, don't hesitate, Kichi Mabara. Oh, he's gonna screw it up here. He's not good at acting cool. Rena was acting the same as always, wasn't she? I needed to respond in my usual way. Naturally, of course. But both my throat and mouth had gone dry, and my lips were stuck together. Hurry and answer, Keiichi. Not that much time had passed. I could still keep the conversation going naturally. I had to say something quickly. Uh. Rena playfully mimicked what I said when I finally squeaked something out. Rena's reaction was still normal. It seems that there wasn't as long of a pause as I had thought. 
Somehow, I finally squeaked out the rest. <laughs> However, my strained efforts neither sullied nor brightened Rena's expression. For a moment, I panicked, thinking I had replied incorrectly. Oh, man. Just imagine having to walk on eggshells around your friends like that, thinking if you say the wrong thing, you're going to die. That's horrible. But after a few moments, Rena broke into her usual soft smile and giggled with a joyful voice that seemed to echo through the morning air. Being strung along by that laugh, I couldn't help but laugh as well. So <laughs> My timid smile froze again. Did you make it without swallowing the sewing needle? Was that what she was asking? If I had swallowed it, I wouldn't be here. Yeah, on the wall. <laughs> I was scared out of my wits, but that's how I played it. <laughs> oh, great. It's funny, I was joking towards the beginning of this game about how the penalties will get, like, increasingly more horrible. I might not be too far off the mark. Obviously not going to happen at school in front of everybody, but... Oh, boy. We both laughed at each other again. To a casual observer, it was just a typical morning. If I could just let myself believe, then even I'd think it was just the usual morning routine. But I was certain I wasn't mistaken. There was something unimaginable buried beneath that facade of this giggling Rena. I recall that unexpected, piercing voice I could hardly believe came from Rena's mouth. The moment that image crossed my mind, I felt a cold sweat trickle down my back. Was it only at that particular time that something evil had possessed Rena? No, that was wrong. That was still Rena. Uishi san told me, didn't he? Yeah, I want to get into this, like her whole, like, what's going on with Rena. Something dark. Oh boy. Oh, those eyes. Rena had a disorder that normal people didn't. No matter how pleasantly she smiled, that fact would not change. But I couldn't even imagine how she looked as she broke all the glass throughout the school. One thing I knew that it wasn't something spur of the moment. If it was some sudden outburst of anger, then maybe she'd break a pane or two. But she broke all the windows all throughout her school. Just imagine going through your own school breaking the windows with a bat. Swinging full force at East... Uh, each pane of glass, one after another, paying no heed to the flying shards. Your classmates aghast, unable to move from the sudden turn of events. I wonder where she could have found the most windows lined up in a row. Probably the hallway. Walk, wind up, smash, walk, wind up. Is it bad that that sounds like oddly therapeutic? It was difficult for me to connect that horrifying image with the Rena smiling at me right now. But I just had to imagine it. Impossible because it was unimaginable. That naive way of thinking no longer worked. The unpleasant, piercing sound of shattered glass. The crunching noise as Rena treads across the broken shards, walking towards me. Rena's classmates going pale as they forgot to even breathe. I wonder what they did as Rena came closer, breaking windows along her path. Did they earnestly try to bring her to her senses by saying something? Or did they jump at her, trying to stop her savagery? Or did they run to the staff room to call for the teachers? Probably none of those. In the face of that blood-curdling sight, of Rena bursting window, busting window after window, undoubtedly all they could do was silently clear a path for her. Dumbfounded, just clearing the path for Rena to continue. It would be cruel to blame anyone for looking the other way. No, they weren't simply looking the other way. No, they weren't simply looking the other way. They knew it was the only way they could to protect themselves. They had done something differently from the rest. They may have suddenly found themselves as Rena's new target. And it's like they said with the, uh, you know, this whole curse is like when they find a target, everyone else just hides and does not interfere because they don't want to be the next target. 
What would Rena have done to whoever attracted her attention? The answer was obvious. She would have undoubtedly acted according to her whims. Meaning they would, I would, be the next window. Rena staring into my eyes, shards of glass crunching and crackling underfoot as she drew closer. I was also drawn into her eyes, paralyzed. Ooh. That, that makes me think of the very beginning with that whole thing about that person getting beat. Still don't know who that was. Is that Keiichi? Is that someone else? Who's the one doing the, the killing? Did that actually happen? Was that a dream? Ah, oh, I don't know. Then Rena struck me with the bat over and over again like I was one of those windows. I crouched down on the floor, desperately protecting my head. Rena didn't care whether it was my head or my back. Zealously, she hits me again and again. What kind of expression was she making as she was doing this over and over again? I peered up to see. Her expression was so indifferent, it was completely nervous. Yeah, this is like the thing at the beginning where it's like, she, she's not speaking, I'm getting hit, uh, you know, not saying anything, no expression. It's because no matter how many times she struck me, I didn't make as ple uh, pleasant a sound as the other windows. She struck me continuously, over and over again. The sound Rena wanted didn't come out. Our classmates standing around didn't try to stop her. They didn't want to be the next window. Somebody save me. Turning a blind eye unless we're hanging out? But of course, everyone in class scrambled to obtain the highest standardized test scores. They gained nothing from saving a cram school tryhard like me. Eventually, there would be a faint sound, similar to when you crack open a walnut. Some sort of reddish-black spray would shoot out. Anyway, it wasn't that Rena momentarily lost herself in her anger. After forcing myself to breathe and calming down my heart, I recalled what Uishi-san told me. Following that, Rena was suspended and had regular examinations at the hospital. Then, as Rena was undergoing counseling, she said it over and over. I'm so sorry, I keep doing that at least a couple times every episode, skipping it. That was only a piece of their conversation, so I still couldn't see the big picture, but it was by no means a happy little conversation. Then what Rena did, was she saying that ghastly incident was a result of her being possessed by Oyashiro-sama? Up until now, I didn't want to believe in Oyashiro-sama's curse. That's why I wanted to say the mysterious deaths every year happen because of some sort of conspiracy. Every time I talked with Oishi-san, I was more certain that the deaths were the work of men and not some curse. Except, if it was people perpetrating the incidents, my friends were somehow deeply connected. If I refused to believe that the curse was real, then I would have to believe that those who acted the kindest to me were deeply involved in the incidents. Why? How? For what reason? Was Rena? Was everyone? It was much more painful and troublesome than, uh, than accepting it was just Oishiro Sama's curse. In the aftermath, Rena had admitted to her doctor it was because she was possessed by Oishiro Sama. I felt a strange sense of relief from that. So that's how it was. There wasn't a second side to Rena. She did that because she was possessed by something strange like Oishiro Sama. It wasn't Rena's fault. Oishiro Sama was the one to blame. I knew. This was all backwards. Refusing to believe that there was a curse, I wanted there to be a human perpetrator. Now that my close friends were the ones under suspicion, I changed my beliefs at my own convenience, saying it was Oishiro Sama's curse to blame. Which was the better choice, accepting that Oishiro Sama's curse exists, or that Rena and the rest of them were deeply involved in the string of mysterious deaths? I didn't want to think about it. <laughs> Rena's just looking at him like, You've just been staring off into space for the past 20 minutes. If I just didn't think about it, I'd be able to continue the same as always. I wanted to believe that. But that was no longer possible. I had received their message. 
it was pathetic of me to try and bend the meaning to my own convenience. Regardless of whether my opponent was a human or a curse, I won't let it kill me. As if I would just bend over and give in, for no good reason at all. Yeah, she's like, <laughs> like, you have not talked at all. Inhaling sharply upon hearing Rena's voice, I came back to my senses. Before I had realized it, we were already at the entrance. Shaking my head a few times, I exercised all those terrifying thoughts. No matter how you looked at it, there's no way Rena could have done such terrible things. It was like I was trying to pl uh, placate myself. Oh, here we go. Ugh, I just gotta act like everything's totally normal. As I slid the door open, a blackboard eraser loaded with chalk dropped down on my head the moment I stepped into the classroom. The chalk dust went into my eyes, inducing a brief moment of agony. It's just weird because it's not like that happy, bubbly music usually when he walks in the classroom and something happens. It's just dead silent. Somehow I feel like when Rika eventually kind of goes all weird, that's, she's going to be the creepiest because she's just a cute, quiet little girl. It's always the ones you, uh, you know, the ones that you least expect. They're the ones that are the scariest when they snap. Not quite in the mood for it, I didn't really react to Sadako's trap. Sadako braced herself as I passed by, expecting me to attack her. She seemed a bit disappointed as I simply walked by silently. <laughs> Alright, where's Mio though? <laughs> Suddenly there was a slap down on my shoulder. It hurt a bit. And oh, there she is. Oh, it's just creepy because they all just seem like their usual selves and to know the darkness behind it. It was Mion. My mind was full with the stuff about Rena, but Mion was also a party of interest. Remember, Keiichi. That hawkish gaze from yesterday. Ah. Uh, ohayo. Nanda, nanda. Zuibun to haki no nai aisatsu jan? Sashi ire no ohagi, chan to tabete kurenakatta no? I'm like this because I ate them. Those words were itching to be blurted out. Yappa, shokyoku ga nakute sa. いくつかは食べたけどだいぶ残しちゃったんだあれじゃあ宿題はどれがレナの手作りかってのの回答はいやあの、ワンワンのガーデンニードレンあれじゃあ、あれじゃあ、あれじゃあ、あれじゃあ
what I shouldn't forget was how dangerous of a situation I was in. I had fallen out of favor with them. After interacting with Uishi-san multiple times, I could see it as I was getting closer to the heart of the matter. The warning yesterday with the mochi was a good indicator of that. No, calling it a warning was just my habit of understating things. It probably had no meaning beyond stunting my uh, progress and buying themselves some time. Until they had a method of completely erasing me, they were just biding their time. Even though they were keeping me under their thumb with threats, it didn't change the fact that I knew too much. The chilling sensation on my desk made me recall Satoshi Huju. Huju? The boy who was using the seat until last year when he disappeared. Was he also similar to me? Did he learn something he shouldn't have and was erased? Damn. I wouldn't let them get rid of me so easily. Never. But were they really trying to kill me? I've had these contradictory feelings for a while now. Even though I suspected them, I felt I had to cover for them. Even having witnessed all their suspicious behavior, a morning like this just made it all seem like an elaborate hoax. No, that's just what I want to believe. Doubting my friends? Covering for them? My life was in danger. Or was it? Actually, I was debating the wrong point. Given my current situation, those points were something that should have been deliberated on a long time ago. But really, Rena and the rest of them, were they actually aiming to kill me? The little voice inside me continued to torment me with these unresolvable trains of thought. Are you an idiot, Kaichi Marbara? The answer should be obvious. But maybe that sewing needle might have just been an accident, right? How could you screw up and drop a sewing needle into a piece of mochi? The benefit of the doubt can only go so far. Both Rena and Mion had acted and behaved suspiciously, but maybe it was all some sort of misunderstanding. What kind of misunderstanding? It wasn't just suspicious, it was outright ludicrous, right? Rena just corrected me for lying, and Mion only asked me about what I had for lunch. Rena was standing outside my door eavesdropping for a solid hour. She was probably just waiting for my phone call to end. For a whole hour outside your room? And is it normal to go home afterwards without saying anything? You heard from Oishi-san, didn't you? About what Rena did at her former school? But at the hospital, she said it was Oishi-sama. Uh, I was doing really well with Oishiro-sama's name. It was Oishiro-sama's fault. She... Oh, God. Did you just... Did you just say that out loud? Yeah? I inadvertently blurted those words out loud. Ah, God damn it, Keiichi. In one job. I mean, acting completely normal. That's a little much to, you know, expect... But, yeah, don't go saying that stuff out loud. Hearing myself say that so directly left me dumbfounded for a few moments. Afterwards, I had to look around to check if anyone else had heard it. My little solilo uh, soliloquy cut a little too close to the truth. Even though I could feel the murderous intent from Ren and the others, part of me somewhere was still trying to deny that. This late in the game, such hesitation could be fatal. I knew that. But I was just your average student. A man living his normal, ordinary life... Once again, if you really are that suspicious. And I don't know if it would help you to get away, but, like, tell your parents. Like, don't tell them this. They're not gonna believe it. But just be like, hey, I miss living in the city, or, like, I just, I don't want to live here anymore. Is there, like, is there a relative? Is there someone he could stay with? Like, ugh. I mean, in the same situation, I wouldn't just jump right to the gun and think that because I'd be like, this is crazy. What am I doing? I'm probably just overthinking this. But at the same time, from an outside perspective, I'm like, get out of there. It's like watching a horror movie and you're just like, ugh. Oh. Do you think I could suddenly believe that my friends, who I had been happily laughing together with up until last Sunday, now intended to kill me? Right? This time I remembered to keep my voice down so only I could hear it. That didn't sound very soft to me. There was one thing I now understood. I was too soft. I didn't completely understand how dangerous Rena and the rest of them were. No, I wasn't trying to understand. I was too soft for not listening to Ishi-san when he was earnestly showing me the heart of the matter. I didn't listen because I was too busy pretending to be dejected. I didn't comprehend it. I was just running away. I didn't comprehend it, so nobody had any notion to try and kill me? 
I needed to get rid of such naive thoughts. As I made that resolution, I heard the bell signaling the end of class. Oh, man, dude. Don't let them walk you home. So soon. Stay in groups. But not that group. Other people. Make new friends. <laughs> Go find some other people to hang out with. The day was already over. I didn't recall eating lunch or doing anything in class. My friends were putting their desks together in preparation for club activities. Not long ago, I would probably have happily jumped into that circle. Oh no, I used to look so forward to club activities. Now I'm scared of the penalties. They're probably going to say that like he's going to try and leave and they're going to be like, Hey, hey now, you have a penalty for not doing your homework. The way Sadako spoke was so typical and familiar, it almost physically hurt. God, I can only imagine how you'd feel, just like... <laughs> Seeing Rena's expression, which said she was really looking forward to today, was hard to take. Keiichi, maybe Uishi-san is just some enormous jerk trying to separate me from the others by lying to me. <laughs> like I said, I can't be soft, and then he just takes one look at Rena and he's just like... Mm but maybe I'll be okay. Slap. Trying to expunge such weak-minded thinking, I slap myself in the face. Yeah, was Rena really trying to kill me? Are they by themselves right now? Like, if there were... It's... I, yeah, school's over, so they would be by themselves. That's that's gonna be a no for me, dog. Like, I gotta go home. If it was this was at lunchtime with other people around, maybe. I wish someone would tell me it was a hoax. I didn't care if it actually was one or not. I just wanted someone to say it was. Another weak-willed thought. How did I ever become this naive? Apparently, that was how my inner dilemma appeared to Rena. Eh, you stay away from me. Nope, nope, nope. Yeah, it's Upon hearing that I wasn't going to participate in the club meeting, Mion pouted unhappily. Uh-oh, they're all looking at me like, Dude... Uh, they're gonna kill me! I wouldn't fall for such a dumb taunt. Without even a real retort, I just grabbed my bag and was about to get up. Someone's hand perched it gently on my head. It was Rika-chan. She was stretched up as far as she could, doing her best to pat my head with her petite hand. It felt so nice, which made things even harder. Okay, good on Keiichi. I was afraid he was gonna get drawn in. He was gonna get, like, guilt-tripped. That's all I said as I quickly left the classroom. They're not gonna let me just walk away, are they? They said something to me as I was leaving, but I couldn't make it out. I managed to make it all the way to the entrance in that state of mind. Took out my shoes, put them on, and went forward. Forward. Harden that heart, Keiichi, my bara. They were, for some unfathomable reason, trying to kill me. They were plotting something dubious, watching my every move. But I couldn't hate them. Because weren't they my friends? Part of me lamented my naivete, while another part lamented the fact I had lost something important by lamenting it over it in the first place. It felt like my personality was being ripped in two, along with my body. This was what o Oyashiro-sama's curse was like. Then it was just too harsh. Hey... Oyashiro-sama, I was wrong for not believing in your curse. But I believed in it now. Completely. Your curse does exist. So, seriously, give me a break. I beg you, come on. Oh no, are they gonna show up at my house? I'm so afraid. At least my parents are here this time. Dinner was unusually bland. It had no flavor or aroma. The miso soup that normally tantalized my appetite instead tasted like nothing but boiled water. 
Dad was eating with us that night. It was a rare occurrence in this household. When he got into his work, he ate and slept on his own schedule. My dad never cared about the time. Since my dad was at the dinner table, it either meant he had just reached a good point to take a break, or he was in a slump. I wasn't able to pick out much of my mom and dad's conversation, but I could tell it wasn't a very pleasant topic. That, of course, made the disgusting food even less appe uh, appealing. Staring listlessly at the exchange between my parents, my mind wandered off to the same thought process as I had had going all day long. Friends close to me. No, they used to be friends. But I could no longer trust them. Right now, I was greatly lacking in allies. People I trusted. People I could depend on when push came to shove. They were something I just didn't have. Having just one ally would have been incredibly reassuring in the currently hopeless situation I was in. I put down my chopsticks and looked over at my parents, who were still talking about work. The first course of action that came to mind was to tell my parents everything. Oh. Oh, no. Oh, I feel like by putting- by telling his parents they're gonna know and they're gonna be in danger too, though. Currently, there wasn't a single person from Hinemazawa I could trust 100%. That meant the only people I could trust were my parents. But if I told them everything that happened up until now, would they understand? Rena, for example. That neighborly Rena, who was so diligent in looking after me, came to get me every day and sometimes brought over a share of what she made. How could I explain that she wanted to kill me? No matter how I explained it, it would probably be difficult for anybody to comprehend. My somewhat eccentric dad wouldn't understand, and my high-strung mom would probably drag me off to a psychiatrist in the blink of an eye. Sadly, that was the amount of trust that existed in our relationship. Even if they did come to understand, what could they possibly do? Unless they could uncover the truth, they wouldn't be able to protect me. No, by informing them of these unnecessary things, I'd be putting my parents in danger as well. Exactly. Considering the victims in past is incidents were often married couples, I couldn't even joke about it. For the entire Maibar family to have an accident or to just vanish into thin air, it was easily possible in Hinamazawa. What was important here was knowing something unnecessary put you in danger. The most unsettling question was, how did they know that I knew? As long as they didn't know, my parents might not fall victim. That was one way to think about it, I guess. At least, it was like that in my case. After I found out, things started becoming odd. In other words, it meant the following. As long as my parents didn't know anything, nothing would happen to them. I hope so. Which means that this house would be a safe haven as long as my parents were in. Oh boy. Oh, I don't know about that. Is that true of all of the people that were, you know, disappeared and stuff? Like, did they know about this? Or were they... I guess if they lived in Hinemazawa, they would know about the curse, so... They would know automatically, but my parents are kind of sheltered from that. I knew these were just assumptions based on uh, conjecture on top of conjecture. Wanting this house to be a safe haven, that was the pinnacle of my weak-willed method of thinking. I had to concede that it was not completely safe. It was only safer than the outside. I knew I couldn't rely on my parents. No, I couldn't risk getting my parents involved. Then the only person who could be my ally would be Uishi-san, him and him alone. He was the only person who understood the situation I was in. Oh, it's tough though, because the more he, like, hangs out with Uishi-san, the worse it's gonna get with the girls. He didn't care so much about my safety, but he was without a doubt passionate about solving this case. It was a bit frustrating. Uishi-san was basically the whole reason I was in this mess. Now to get out of it, I had to rely on him. Meaning, it was all going according to his devices. It was just my job to look appetizing while bobbing in the waves as bait. Then when the fish started gathering around, Uishi-san would pull up the big haul. It was slightly infuriating, but even I thought it was the best course of action. So then, what should I do? Patience was the first rule of fishing. Just keep waiting until the fish actually bites. But I wasn't simply bait. There was lots of ways for me to struggle before being devoured. 
When they struck, I needed to somehow dodge just enough and tag out to Oishi-san. No question, it was going to be hard. The timing to bring Oishi-san in would be difficult. He was in the city, not Hinemazawa. So if I phoned him in my moment of need, it would take him about 30 minutes to reach me. So I needed to run away for those 30 minutes. For example, if we set up a rendezvous point for dire situations or something. I would just have to hide out there until Oishi-san arrived. Yes. I was still being chased around in the dark by boogeymen, but now I knew which way to go. I would never have imagined this would be so reassuring. Oh yeah. It would probably be best if I had a concealed weapon for when things got rough. Typically, that would call for a switchblade. But that wasn't too reassuring for combat. Also, since it was recognized as a weapon by the public, that also wasn't good. Really, when the time comes, a long weapon like a bat would work in my favor. I remember there was a metal bat at school. I could be confident with that when push came to shove. If I pretended I was practicing my swing, then it wouldn't be suspicious for me to always carry it around. I could go to school early tomorrow and secure it. Just possessing a weapon may be enough to deter them. Also, one more thing. Insurance. It could be something like a note or memo. I could write down, write down everything that's happened as a sort of journal. In case I suddenly vanish, the journal would be left behind. With my journal in his possession, Uishi-san should be able to avenge my death. I left my parents engrossed in their conversation about work and went back to my room. I'm just waiting for Rena to be hiding out in there. I tore out a piece of paper from a notebook and made my way to my desk. Last time I wrote a journal was for summer homework in elementary school. In the off chance something bad happened, the police could use my diary as a lead. So I should only write down the facts. How should I start? I jotted down my thoughts as they came. I, Keiichi Maibara, am in fear for my life. It made me laugh nervously. It was a line that showed up often in detective stories. I never even dreamed I would be in the type of situation where I'd write it myself. I do not know why they are after my life. Rena and the others were suspicious, but I had no proof. And that's why I couldn't write anything more. I laughed wryly at myself for writing such a passage draped in mystery. Would the police be able to get the hint from reading this enigmatic passage? I can only pray that they would. What I prayed for the most, though, was that this journal never needed to play its part. Here, I laughed nervously. It was too simple, so I wrote down one more line I just thought of. The only thing I do know is that it has to do with o Oyashiro Sama's curse. Was that too much? I probably shouldn't write more than that. If I wrote anything more, then it would seem like I was just delusional. In order to appear to the reader that the person who had written this was of sound mind, I chose not to write anything else at that point. I just needed to add more as I learned more about the truth. I folded the paper and thought about a place to hide it. By hiding it somewhere obvious, there was a chance that they would uncover it instead. On the other hand, if it was in too obscure of a location, then there was the risk of nobody finding it at all. In the end, I decided to take off the clock off my wall and stick my folded note on the back of it with scotch tape. After that, I put the clock back into its normal position. Yeah. It didn't look like anything was hidden behind it. Now I needed to set up such that if anything happened to me, my parents could find it. I looked at it from countless different angles until I was satisfied, and I made my way downstairs. My parents were still talking about work. It didn't look like it was going to end anytime soon, so I cut in. I'd never started off a conversation like that before, so my parents were both startled. They stopped talking and turned towards me. I didn't think their talk was more urgent than mine. In any case, I started my request. Both of my parents' eyes went wide as saucers. If they did that, then they'd probably find it. My memoir. Both my parents remained wide-eyed, not moving an inch. I couldn't blame them. Yeah, 
Just imagine the parent's perspective. Their kid is just suddenly talking about, like, if I die... Mom was finally able to ask me with a questioning gaze. Of course, this was a normal response for when someone's son suddenly talked about a subject like this. I felt bad about making them worry, but right now I just wanted them to think about the clock in my room. With the awkward mood leaving the room in silence, I decided to go back up to my room. Saying only that, I left the living room. See, I'm afraid that they're going to want to check the clock and be like, why did he mention the clock? And they're going to find the note, they're going to learn about the curse, and they're going to be in danger. I needed to get to school early tomorrow and secure that bat. I should make today the last day I went to school with Rena. As I climbed the stairs, I heard my mom call my name, but I pretended not to hear her. It wasn't something I could talk about with my parents. If I talked about it, it would only make things more dangerous. The fight that had begun was mine and mine alone. I couldn't rely on anybody. I wouldn't be killed. Not when I still knew nothing. Alright, I have a feeling that tomorrow when I go get that bat, Rena's gonna be there. And she's got experience with bats, so we'll see. Oh, I wonder if they're going to go into a little bit more into the girl's perspective of things. Maybe we'll get some insight into, uh, like, what they actually think about the whole situation here and their thoughts and things. Like, it sounds like them. It sounds like just them being their normal selves, but maybe we'll see a darker turn here. <laughs> oh. That was kind of creepy. けいちゃんと車で話してたの。Oh, it almost sounds like... It almost sounds like Mion is kind of... Leading Rena on, like, maybe Mion knows about Rena's weird thing with Oishiro-sama. So maybe Mion's kind of twisting things around, since Rena is relatively new... You know, coming back to Hinamizawa. So maybe Mion kind of took her under her wing and is kind of, I don't know, feeding her information or making her think a certain way. Mm, maybe there's something else to this. Who to believe? It's like I have Oishi as kind of like my savior, and maybe there's something more to him. Tenko? Lena <laughs> Oh, that breathing Rena does? I don't like that. An empty silence hung in the air. And then it was suddenly interrupted. <laughs> oh, ho, ho. by loud laughter. That's creepy AF. Okay there. Alright, back on to this. Alright. 
I'm very nervous for Keiichi. Is he gonna make it to... to the school and get the bat before someone sees him? This was the first time I'd ever woke up with such clarity. It was 5.59, just moments before my alarm would go off. I was amazed at the precision of my internal clock. I had made preparations for the next day of school before I went to bed. I changed quickly and descended to the deserted lower floor. It appeared that my mom was still asleep. Neither breakfast nor lunch was ready. Yesterday, I had just unilaterally de uh, declared I would be leaving early today, so it couldn't be helped. I slathered jam on some bread and topped it with some instant cocoa. Just as I was finishing up breakfast, Mom rose groggily from her slumber. <laughs> Answering bluntly, I picked up my bag and stood after stuffing two slices of bread down my throat. If I waited for her to make my lunch, then it would end up being the same time as usual. If I did that, it would raise the chances of me running into Rena and Mion on the way. Yes, from today onwards, I was going to go to school alone. Gotta think it's like, from his mom's perspective, he's asking about like, if I die, and now he's just being really weird about trying to get to school early? I took the thousand yen bill from mom and slipped it into my pocket. I have no reason to tell her every little detail now, do I? Finding it difficult answering the onslaught of questions, I made an annoyed face. It's not that I didn't trust my parents. I just couldn't rely on them. They couldn't help me. I could only hope that they didn't get involved. It was safer that way. My mom's annoying voice was cut off by the slam of the door. For the first time since I moved here, I headed down the road to school alone. Up until now, I had always walked down the same path at the same time each day. So I always met with the same people at the same places. But today was different. I didn't meet the people I would normally, and nobody was at the places where I would have normally met them. Of course, Rena wasn't in the spot where we usually met, and there wasn't anyone at the spot where we would have met up with Mion. The length of the tree shadows and the, uh, the morning air and the brightness of the sun it was a completely different type of morning from what I was used to. Without a doubt, it felt strange. It left me with the impression that I had destroyed the illusion Hinemazawa had set up for me before it had enough time to prepare all the props needed to deceive me. The person who called out to me was someone we always passed by as they were taking a long walk along the edges of the fields. It's almost like the characters in the, the characters, I say, but the people in the village are almost like NPCs and they have like their preset schedules of where they are at certain times. Their name was, uh, I forgot. Of course, this wasn't the spot where we usually passed each other. I threw out a random excuse. I was being asked the same type of questions my mom was asking. So I answered them in the same uninteresting, vague manner. <laughs> That information's gonna get back to them, being like, Hey, Keiichi is being weird. It wasn't funny being asked where Rena was each time I passed by someone. But maybe it was to be expected. It was because for so long, we were always together so amicably. Even I felt that if I let my guard down, we could still be fret- Stop it, Keiichi. Don't think about that anymore. You spent all day yesterday thinking about how dangerous it was to go soft, didn't you? Beep beep. A car horn blared from out of nowhere. And Oishi. It is kind of weird he always just seems to be around, isn't it? Even though I was walking lost in thought, that horn was way too close. A mechanical behemoth barreled at me from behind, catching me completely off guard. By the time I turned around, the van's hulking uh, chases was almost on top of me. Oh. Okay. 
Oh, okay. I thought it was Uishi for a second. I'd seen plenty of cars veer to the opposite shoulder to avoid pedestrians, but this car was doing the opposite. It felt like... It felt like there was somebody on the opposite shoulder, and the van was swerving in my direction to avoid them. That blissfully ignorant train of thought delayed me from realizing something much, much more important. What? What? That large... Oh, I don't like that sound. That was scary. That large mass was hurtling right at me. Was it going to hit me? The inside of my head instantly flooded with a painfully cold liquid. In that moment, the scene before me... No, time itself had frozen. In the silence of that frozen moment, I compared the van, so close I had no way to dodge it, and my body, the upper half twisted awkwardly in order to look behind me. There was no way I could dive out of the way in my current position. If I lost focus now, this moment would unpause and I would probably be plowed over, caught in this silly pose. Bend my upper body over towards the paddy by the side of the road. If I bent far enough, I'd get away with just being hit by the side view mirror. As soon as the thought crossed my mind, the temporal status was shattered by the deafening sound of the van. The side mirror struck my shoulder, sending me spinning off through the air like a top, locked in my contorted position. Kaplash. Sent tumbling through the air, I crashed into the muddy paddy by the side of the road. <laughs> that's like, that's like Hinamizawa being like, hey, you don't go off your schedule. You do what you're supposed to do. You go where you're supposed to go, when you're supposed to go, or stuff is going to happen. My entire body was soiled and drenched. But the choice I had made in that instant was un uh, unmistakably for the best. I was covered in mud, but when the alternative was being hit by the car, it was the closest I could be to being unscathed. Rising up from the paddy, I had enough in me to glare over the stop van and yell profanities at the driver. I'm not sure if he was able to see me, but the van sped off suddenly. <laughs> I couldn't help but continue yelling out profanities. The disgrace from being covered in mud hurt me more than any physical wounds. I slogged through the muddy paddy and made my way back onto the road. Shit, I'll track you down and sue you. If I go looking for a van, I'm sure to find it in this little village. The path I was on had rice paddies on either side, and it had become so narrow that one car could barely fit through. It wasn't a place you could tear full speed down in a car, let alone pass by pedestrians. Not only was it a narrow road, but the car just now was closer to my side of the road than the other when it went past me. Even as I cursed, I was desperately trying to suppress the dark cloud roll it, uh, roiling up within me. This wasn't just a hit and run. That car just now was trying to run me over, wasn't it? Thinking back, I did feel like there had been a car creeping up on me slowly for a while. That's right, as soon as I'd parted ways with that person taking a walk, I had that feeling the whole time. If it had wanted to pass me, then it had no shortage of chances. Normally, I would have felt suspicious and turned around sooner, but I was so lost in thought and now was kicking myself for not realizing it was there sooner. And then, when the path became narrow and there was no one else in sight, he floored it. If I had hesitated for even a moment, the result would have been no laughing matter. As the adrenaline rush from nearly being run over subsided, and the realization of how terrifying the preceding events were sunk in. There was no doubt about it. That van was intentionally trying to hit me. A cold, vicious sweat seeped from my scalp and slid down my back before dribbling off. I struggled to avoid falling into a panic. There was still the possibility that this was really just an accident. Calm down, Keiichi. But also, don't be so naive, Keiichi. Being that lax will get you killed next time. You need to always be on your toes. Don't give them any openings. My enemy was really out to kill me. The next time, they would use a more reliable method. That time came and I was acting like I was now? Getting covered in mud was the price I had paid for my own naiv naivete. Covered in mud, but without injury. Not even a sprain. I guess this is what you would call the silver lining. I began walking again, this time cautiously. I wouldn't even show a hint of carelessness. I had suspected only Rena and the others up until now. No, it was because I had suspected them that I believed there were no other enemies. Uishi-san had said so, didn't he? There was the possibility of a village conspiracy. Was I really mired so deeply in the situation I had no choice but to try and carry on as usual? Wouldn't it be safest just to hold myself up in my house or move? Just a thought. 
But the moment I abandoned my regular routine, everyone around me would abandon theirs as well. That was just too horrifying of a thought. Just something as simple as getting up early and, like, just going off on his own for one day to school and this happened. Like, imagine how terrifying that is, is just thinking, not just your friends, but, like, the whole village that you're living in. Everyone is potentially against you and wants to kill you. That's terrifying. I recall the tales Uishi-san told me of when Hinimizawa was still called Onigafushi, a frightening tale of an entire village of demons hunting their prey, surrounding them and eating them alive. One must not interfere with the demons. One must pretend not to see it. The enemy was numerous, the whole village. The villagers with their unwavering faith in the curse would do nothing to help me. A strong, sudden flash of sunshine made me slightly dizzy. I had no idea what was going on anymore. When I suspected it was the work of man, I would catch a glimpse of Oyashiro-sama's curse. And when I suspected it was Oyashiro-sama's curse, someone would poke their head out. What was coincidence? What was intentional? Who was my enemy? Who was just a bystander? No, what I really, truly wanted to know was, how did I end up with the proverbial bullseye painted on my back? And, like, maybe... Maybe this all kind of... I'm not going to say all of it is in his head, but maybe there's some in his head. Maybe he himself is, like, slowly being possessed, and he's just becoming more paranoid, and he's lashing out. I wouldn't say he's lashing out at people, but he's, like, suspicious of people. So, like, how much of this is the villagers, and how much of this is his own kind of internal, like, psychosis. I love this stuff. I love anything that's, like, psychological. I love this shit so much. Eventually, an answer in a form I can understand will appear. I don't care when that will happen, because until then, I cannot die. That alone fueled my resolve to fight and will keep me alive.